the United States Navy is poised to meet the future with a new generation of high-tech transformer-like fighting machines. Fast. Increase your bucket to left 15. 36 knots and increasing. Yeah, here we go, here we go. Versatile. Made up, made up. All right, get this done quickly. And deadly. We're green range to kill it, kill it. These are the pioneering warships, USS Freedom and USS Independence. In the 21st century, the U.S. Navy must deal with a new wave of violent threats. The world has changed since the end of the Cold War in the early 1990s when we were focused mainly on an open ocean war with our aircraft carrier battle groups, cruisers, and destroyers. The spread of modern weaponry has uh, gone from state hands to out-of-state hands. Mines, anti-ship cruise missiles, fast swarming attack craft and operate in very shallow water where our legacy ships can't get in at them. In response, the Navy commissioned a new class of warship. The LCS, or littoral combat ship. Their cutting edge design uses aluminum to lighten the weight of the ship, allowing them to operate in the shallow waters known as the littorals. They're very fast ships. They use water jets, which makes them highly maneuverable. They can go faster than any of the threat surface craft they might encounter. They can add new combat systems without having to do a wholesale change out of the computing architecture. That's a first in the United States Navy. Freedom and Independence, the first two ships of the class, are prototypes that the Navy is still refining. They are research and development ships, and they went from idea to hitting the fleet in about half the length of time of what we normally would do for a surface combatant. So we're still learning a lot. Now, both ships must pass a grueling round of tests if they hope to stay on schedule to deploy with the rest of the fleet. In Southern California, crews install one of three interchangeable combat systems on Freedom. The Surface Warfare Mission Package. The ship's captain is 17-year Navy veteran Commander Patrick Thien. Surface Warfare Mission Package consists of uh, two 30-millimeter gun mounts mounted back above my flight deck, two 11-meter rigid hull inflatable boats, or ribs, what we like to call them, and an uh, MH-60 Romeo helicopter. The backbone of the package, two 30-millimeter high-velocity cannons have been used for years on marine expeditionary vehicles. All right, ready? Now Thien hopes to prove that the guns can work just as well on an LCS ship. Overall objective for this underway is test our combat system against a variety of threats. So it's gonna be fun. We're gonna test the combat system all the way out. The other LCS class ship, USS Independence, prepares to set out from Florida. How many more pallets of uh, supplies do you have? Its captain, Commander Jerry Olin, who enlisted at 18, has worked his way up the chain of command. His ship is installing a different combat system. We're about to take Independence out for testing to try to integrate all the components of the new uh, Mine Countermeasures Warfare mission package. This mission package uses a remote-controlled underwater vehicle and specially equipped helicopter to scan coastal waters for mines, classify them, and then destroy them. Much of this equipment is still unproven, so civilian experts will ride along on both ships. I've got representatives on board from a multitude of program offices that own different components, several uh, naval uh, engineering centers, 501 and with Dahlgren Division, the certification. We are guests on this ship. No one likes, you know, is it guests and fish or go bad after three days. So we have to be very cognizant. We are here not because we have a right to be, but because they allow us to be. Three things right now that I'm looking at for killer tomato. Right. right. They're here to make sure the systems are, number one, operating at design, and number two, if there's some ways we can improve them. 
These two captains will take their civilian and Navy crews out to sea and put their new combat systems to the test. These prototypes must accomplish their missions before they can be used in the real world. Everything that we're doing now is a stepping stone. I want to take the ship out and want to go deploy. We need to be out there and doing things for the fleet, but also I know that we are testing everything out for the follow-on ships of the class. There's some things that we just have to get done. So if we get things right here, and I'll say when we get things right here, all right, we're setting not just us up for success, we are setting the next set of crews up for success because we're setting the future of the Navy right now, right here, okay? Four, three, two, one, mark. Mark time, one zero. Are you ready to start GTM, sir? Yes, start yeah, at number one time. and number two yeah, GTM. On USS Independence, Commander Olin fires up his engines. Shift from manual control to program control. And prepares to get the 127 meter long ship out to sea. Okay, heave around. All right, man. Line six on deck, underway. Underway, shift colors. One thing that's unique about this ship compared to a conventional Navy ship is that it's extremely maneuverable alongside a pier. A traditional ship has screws that push water directly aft, and they rely on rudders to steer the ship. But this ship is essentially an enormous jet ski. We steer by water jets. Power, sir. Back 30% bucket, all engines aye, sir. Because we have water jets, we're able to manipulate the configuration back aft to walk the ship sideways from port to starboard. Good rate of movement off the pier, about a half a knot. But we do have two tugs connected today, and we do that as an insurance policy. The ship is very expensive, and if something were to go wrong, why not have them available? But they won't work today. They're just going to be tied up, standing by, and we're going to work the ship all by ourselves this morning. 70 yards aye. Coming out nice and flat, under control. Independence is a very light ship for its size. I mean, we only draw about 14 feet of water, but we're a very large ship above the water. A trimaran hull gives Independence improved stability during high-speed maneuvers. It also provides a large amount of interior space for its mission packages. Her flight deck is four times the size of a destroyer's. Cam off the deck, I'm in heading mode. Hi. Once Independence is clear of the docks, Captain Olin throttles up and heads for the test area. We can drive 40 plus knots. We'll steer by actually angling a water jet. 40 yards to turn, next course, 243. We can turn on a dime. Very quickly, uh, 80 to 90 degrees per minute, and additionally, we lose very little speed in that turn. 700 right. yards to turn, next course is 250. Recommend 284. USS Independence is one of the fastest Navy ships on the water, but its sister ship is even faster. China, you ready? Ready, sir. Taking all lines, get ship underway. Taking all lines. Underway! Underway. There you go. At 115 meters, the monohulled USS Freedom is smaller than its sister ship, but it still has a large mission bay that gives its crew access to the water. What sets Freedom apart are its powerful gas turbine engines, which generate almost twice as much horsepower as the turbines on Independence. One of the things that, that makes this ship kind of unique is we have the uh, world's largest marine gas turbines. You know what I want to do? Got to blow the carbon out, sir. Sounds good to me. Autopilot engaged, coming to 245. Here we go. Jets are centered. <laughs> <laughs> I like to drive the ship fast. Uh, the ship was designed to go 40 plus knots. So how I look at it is if it's designed to go fast, well, let's go fast and make sure that it can. 37 knots. Very well. She's pulling hard to the right today. 36 knots, right. The ship has clocked speeds at 47 knots, which translates to 87 kilometers per hour. That's about 10 kilometers faster than the larger destroyers and aircraft carriers. 
were designed to ride above the waves, kind of like a speedboat. We also created a rooster tail up above the height of the flight deck. So you've got a 3,000 plus ton warship going 40 plus miles an hour while we're kicking up an Olympic sized swimming pool of water every second by those jets. It's a great, great sight and it's very fun to do. What's your speed? Cab zone three, right by the line. I've got a, a little aggressive personality for ship driving. The US Navy is not used to ships that can drive this fast, so it's a, a great opportunity for me. Every time that we go fast, we're learning something new, and we're figuring out a way to make the future ships of the class better. Drop boost shots? Yeah, drop boost. D2. Now, Freedom must make its way north to the Point Magoo Sea Test Range, just west of Los Angeles, where in the morning, the real mission work will begin. After traveling through the night, Freedom arrives at the test range. All right, I'm going to combat. Commander Patrick Thien starts his day below deck in the Mission Control Center as the first test of the 30 millimeter cannons begins. So you're right, Captain Tio, Olympus Buster 1 set, Mount 301. Olympus uh, 1 set, Mount 301, Captain I. This is our first day of live fire testing. It's pretty much the first time they've ever fired the 30 millimeter mounts off the ship. We're collecting a lot of data to make sure that they do everything that the Navy said they were supposed to do. So if we complete this testing, then the Navy will say, this system is safe and effective. You can use it on all LCS-class ships. Identify yourself and state your attention. I am engaged in transit passage. One grave threat is that a rogue state might close a vital waterway with a swarm of small, fast, missile-firing boats. The LCS-class can use their speed and maneuverability to effectively counter these enemies. Tia Cam, Comex, LFO-1, run one, kill, cruise form target with guns. During this deployment, the Navy will simulate a high-speed attack against Freedom to test her new guns. But the first round will be fired at slower speeds to make sure they're ready for action. Doing a live fire, 30 millimeter gun shoot from uh, each side, mount 301, 302. Gonna do some zero firing, which is essentially making sure that what we're shooting at on target is actually uh, what we're aiming at. We're shooting a static target that's just floating in the water. Like any other gun, you have to align the sights. This one is the same way. While the bridge crew will have a visual on the exercise. Right, you guys drive from up there, just keep it on that spot. The precision shooting takes place two decks below. All the guns are designed to be controlled and fired from a MCC or Mission Control Center. We can still fire the guns locally at the gun mount itself, but then we've lost all the radar sensors and everything else uh, that we use to give us a better picture. It's just not as accurate and not as efficient. Use right, all guns, weapon buster one set. 301's ready. Take firing there, 009 for 1,000 yardage. Clear to fire, weapons free. I'm getting excited. Shortly before 0700 hours, the crew's ready to take their first shot. That's it. Hi, Dan. Shooting a little high. You think? <laughs> Just a little bit? Maybe? So I think they're adjusting for that right now. Why are we doing it now? It's just like zero out a rifle, same thing. Well, that's better. Oh, a lot better. As the calibration continues, Freedom's gun zeroes in on its target with deadly accuracy. Oh, that's right on it. Okay. Oh. oh, that's going right through it. So. Yeah. yeah, that's dead on. OK, three, zero, two, ready? All right, let's go do it. Take firing there. Now, three, zero, two, commencing. Ah, no worries. Nice. Something five round burst. I think you're just gonna keep punching holes in. We can turn it into Swiss cheese. Five round burst. Yeah, there we go. In an actual combat situation, these automatic cannons would be able to take out a small boat two kilometers away. That's what I'm talking about, right there. That thing is Swiss cheese. With the gun zeroed, the T-2 
team moves on to the next task. There it is. It's on your screen. When we do these tests, we start small with low complexity, and we work our way up to more complexity. So right now, we'll move into shooting a slowly moving target. Arm your weapon. Go and burst. Look at that. Nice. The crew has the starboard side gun dialed in. That's here, Cap C fire, Mount 301. Ceasing fire with Mount 301. Then the port side 302 gun takes aim. Oh, 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 go the other way. It's gonna be long. This gun, however, has trouble finding its mark. 302, compact modular sight is down. We can still fire it, but we will not have any stabilization. Check fire, check fire, check fire. Check fire. Gun, check fire on. I am fine if, you, if you're going to lose control of the gun. <laughs> I'm, cra I'm crazy, but I ain't that crazy. This entire deployment is to test these guns. Just a few hours into the exercises, Freedom's mission is already in jeopardy. Really? Closer inspection of the gun mount reveals the sighting mechanism is broken. This will sideline the gun until a replacement part is sent to the ship. These things, they happen. The combat systems on the ship are incredibly complex. This is, again, a brand new ship. This mount has never been installed on a ship like this before. Frustrating, but uh, not frustrating to the point that it's a, a, a game ender that we can't continue on. What's your plan here? Should move us a couple miles so we can chuck a killer tomato and go shoot it. All right, I'm shooting. The team presses on. Great team. Yeah, change their plan. Position for the next event, which is the killer tomato shoot. This time, they'll be firing the ship's native 57 millimeter gun. This gun can accurately hit fast moving targets up to eight and a half kilometers away. So it's Freedom's first line of defense during any attack. All stations TAO, go ahead and visually and electronically clear the range. TAO, I hold range visually and electronically clear. Although a permanent fixture on every LCS ship, the crew still needs to align the sights of the gun before it is ready for the high speed tests. Being ready for uh, fire action mount 5-1. Once a uh, ship is coming, we'll cross 270. We'll uh, kill the train. With a four meter barrel length, the cannon shoots larger rounds, so it demands a bigger target. And then our engagement will be against a killer tomato, which is essentially a, uh, a big balloon, a 10 foot cube floating on the water, a uh, big orange thing we can see and shoot at downrange. Hey, we're standing by to start LFO2. All right, uh, man, ready, ready to go. We're green range to kill it. Kill it. DSO firing. Man's gonna shoot. Oh, uh -huh. know that. The gun is hitting its mark, but the killer tomato is a resilient target. They're designed to be able to take a lot of ammunition, take a lot of hits, because otherwise we'd have to just keep continually putting them out there and putting them out there and putting them out there. All right, all stations, Captain. Ceasefire mount 5 1. So Thien stops the exercise. Rounds right on target. 57 millimeter gun is working like a champ. But Captain Thien's crew still has some work to do. Bridge Captain, close the enemy killer tomato to 150 yards on a beam. Then we'll go find the damn killer tomato and shoot it. The killer tomato must be cleared off the range. The on the We're gonna sink it. Twisting the port, we're gonna shoot off our port side. Commander Thien gives his crew some practice on the ship's 50 caliber gun. Roger, AFPA, hey, give me a little headway too. I will kill a dang thing here in about two minutes. Come on now. Let's do it. Hey, who's got cops with the uh, gun mount? 502, Captain. Are you man ready? Uh, yes, sir. We still waiting on the ammunition. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to my corner and count to three. Until they don't hurry up, the damn thing's going to sink anyways. Man ready. Man ready. Uh, outstanding. All right. can be a challenge to sink. There you go, right up. You get one hole in. That hole gets covered with water, it fills with water, and now you got a big air pocket. So then you gotta shoot that air pocket. There you go, get on target and kill it. Come on now. The target takes several direct hits, but still fails to deflate. Really? Really? It's going down. I know it's going down, slow. but it ain't going down fast enough. With crew pride on the line. Uh, 
Yeah, Exo Dale Heineken takes over the gun. There we go. Ah, there we go, right on target. Exo the killer. Exo, let me see your war face. Uh, that's some positive feedback. You just say. I like to eat tomatoes. I don't mind slicing up a few. So if I get the chance to kill one, I'll, I'll kill it as well. No target. Davy Jones! Anytime you get to shoot the guns, it's a lot of fun. USS Independence has arrived at a simulated minefield to begin the high-tech hunt for mines. How long has it been raining? I'm getting a little bit of mist, really no, no rain. OK. But morning brings a setback. Good morning, Independence. This is the captain. The schedule has changed significantly. We're experiencing uh, close to 30 knots of true wind. Uh, we have predictions of gusts up to 50 knots. Uh, there's a small craft advisory, which means we can't proceed. While Independence is more than capable of handling rough seas, the small civilian support craft monitoring the testing are beached this early in the testing process. We want to have the conditions somewhat favorable because we're just learning how to operate these systems. And it's very dangerous, you know, launching this very heavy equipment into the seas when the seas are very rough. The wind's still coming out of the south? Yes, sir, it's from the south at 20 knots. All right, so we're going to be rolling around pretty good. To make matters worse, the ship's trimaran hull may be fast, but its shallow draft can make for a rough ride. Yeah, we'll be rolling all over the place for the next hour. When we get to the 10 mile mark from shore, uh, we want to turn around and put the seas to our stern, then try to get a good northwest southeast run. Uh, and that'll give us a little bit better ride while we wait this thing out. But uh, the closer we stay to the coast, you know, the less fetch there is on the seas, and uh, the easier our ride will be. So we'll just kind of go back and forth in that range. All right, sir. Okay. Because the ship rocks and rolls a lot when we're underway and under any kind of conditions of bad weather, everything has to be chained down so it can't move, especially big things like this. If this were for some reason to be loose while the ship was pitching back and forth 25 degrees, you wouldn't be able to stop it. It would hit the side and keep going. So that applies to pretty much everything in here. The rough ride is a nuisance, but Captain Olin is worried the delay could mean bigger problems down the line. We have a limited amount of time to get everything done. We have a lot of tests that we have to run. So every day that's lost due to weather, you know, is a part of the mission that we're not going to get done. I'm not going to give up that easy. We'll just kind of stay put and see what happens. For now, Independence's mission to locate sea mines and neutralize them is at the mercy of the seas. But on an optimally manned ship like the LCS, there's always work to be done. Coming through this way. Right. One task, sweepers, takes place every day. And even the commander pulls duty. Well, the ship is really quite large for uh, the number of people on it. It's a lot of work, and the only way you can get it done is if everybody pitches in. Oh, got to get the broom on there. Captain's command philosophy is to have the cleanest ship in the Navy, and everybody cleans, command master chief, XO, CO. You got the combat systems officers right there. He's the uh, bright work extraordinaire. Here's the XO. He's going around doing the same thing pretty much I am. The captain, like, seeing him do sweepers with us, it's, it sets, like, the morale real high. I mean, if the captain's working and you're not working, well, that's pretty clean. It kind of makes you think. It's like, maybe I should actually grab a broom and, like, actually work, you know, so. I started my career cleaning. I'm probably going to end my career cleaning, it looks like. Are we about ready to wrap up here? This is the power of the broom. The crew of Independence polishes off this duty. Good checking course. And by mid-afternoon, there's a break in the weather. It's like true wind is shifting. Commander Hargreaves thinks we should give it one last shot. OK. So all right, let's do it. So we want to call away flight quarters? Yes, sir. OK, another twist. We're on. Okay. The sea has calmed enough to launch the small support craft near shore. And the captain goes forward with the helicopter mission. Our mission today is to conduct a search of a suspected minefield in shallow water using a laser pod that's connected to an aircraft. Sea mines have destroyed hundreds of naval vessels since their first use over 200 years ago. 
and the threat is increasing. Iraqis laid more than 1,300 sea mines in the northern Arabian Gulf during Desert Storm, seriously damaging two Navy vessels. And there are new concerns that terrorists will use mines to sabotage key commercial shipping lanes and waterways, such as the Suez Canal. Clearing these mines has always been a life and death mission. Mine warfare has been conducted from wooden ships that have to enter the minefield and transit at about three knots or so while they search for mines and then have to stop and destroy the mines. They're in the minefield with very valuable cargo on there called a United States Navy sailor. The littoral combat ship allows us to be outside of the minefield to locate and neutralize mines with no danger to the sailors. They do this using a helicopter and a remotely operated semi-submersible to carry out a three-phase process. Detect, identify, and engage. Coming up. One tool used by the helicopter is the Airborne Laser Mine Detection System, known as OMIDS. It's a sensor that attaches to the helicopter that shoots a laser down to the surface of the water to search for shallow water mines. Mounted on a Seahawk helicopter, OMIDS uses pulsed laser light to rapidly image large volumes of water to detect floating and near-surface mines. From the standpoint of the overall mission, it's the first step. If we can get the shallow water cleared, we know that the water is safe for the RMMV and the other sensors to go in. Ten-year Navy veteran Lieutenant Rory Kipper oversees flight operations on the ship. We're just uh, moving the helicopter out now from the hangar. We have personnel walking beside it, making sure that uh, it, it's not going to slip. And we have a guy sitting inside riding the brakes for, for safety. The $25 million MH-60S Seahawk is a proven Navy asset. Its hinged tail and folding blades reduce its footprint aboard ships. Once we get out onto the spot, we can unfold the tail, unfold the uh, main rotor blades, and prepare it for flight. Navy pilots fly the OMID's missions but civilian specialists install it, since the technology is still being tested. Release the straps. All right, slowly raise the weapon. Up, up. The OMIDS is housed in a 370-kilogram pod attached to the helicopter and controlled from the cockpit. Once the pod is ready to launch, Captain Olin and his Navy crew resume control of the mission. Call away flight quarters and let's uh, Get the ship into the seas, so turn into the seas and uh, slow to about eight knots. Flight quarters, flight quarters, all hands man your flight quarters station. All personnel not involved in flight quarters, stay clear of weather next at the frame 50. Covers are not to be worn topside now. With its crew of 40 stretched to the limit, team members must perform multiple jobs. All right, let's go for Buster. All right, GSM Wajarate, ET1 yeah. Hill, yeah. HMC Morris, yeah. GM1 Ryan. See us one nurse stand. Yeah. All right, everyone, don your Mark 1s, your cranials. Stand by outside for FOD walk down. Before they can launch, the crew assembles for a crucial task to clear the deck of foreign object debris, or FOD. All right, FOD walk down. Hey, let's walk the FOD. Culinary specialist Tanika Naristand was in the galley prepping lunch when flight quarters was called. Hey, spread it out. Here on board this ship, we wear many hats. I'm in the galley. I refuel, I'm a medical first responder, stand watch on crew surf weapons, I'm on the fire party, and there's a few other jobs that I know I have that I'm not naming off right now. You're good? Okay. Yeah, all right. We do get sleep, but uh, sometimes it's not much. Amber deck, amber deck. This is the uh, helo control tower. So up here is the uh, helicopter control officer, or HCO. So they're doing a engine startup and rotor engagement. It's actually one of the more dangerous times because until the rotors get fully engaged, they can droop and flop around a bit. The uh, guy down there in yellow on the flight deck is the Atlantic Safety Enlisted. He's the only person in direct contact with the pilots on the flight deck. Turbo Jim, green deck. Green deck, green deck. 
biggest danger is mostly to the, the helicopter itself because if you're on a deck like this, the deck moves around with the water, so you can tip the helo over or have it slide across the deck. So last thing they do before launch is the uh, chalk and chain crew goes up there, removes the chains that are holding it down, removes the chocks from the wheels so it's free to take off. But they want to do that absolutely last in case the ship takes a funny roll or something like that. Helicopter heads out to scan the minefield. Now the aircraft runs track legs in a shallow water field back and forth and uh, tries to detect uh, mines in that area. The main mission here is to create what we call a swept channel. We're able to isolate all the mines that are in the field and neutralize them. That would be the measure of success for us. While the Navy has tested each component of the mine countermeasures mission package separately, this is the first time they will use them all together. Mine warfare is hard, and we're always in a constant battle to be able to counter those threats. Red deck, red deck. So everyone here is rooting for the success of the mission package because we think it's a great capability. They realize this helicopter run must go off without a hitch for independence to have any chance of completing its mission. And visually on the range. After a two hour search mission, the helicopter returns to Independence. The aircraft went out to uh, the suspected minefield, uh, conducted its search, uh, brought the data back to the ship. We downloaded the data from the pod, and they're now conducting uh, data analysis on the ship. Lead tactician Tracy Nye works with the Navy crew to analyze the intel they've gathered. This room is the command and control for mine warfare. The screens are all classified. The data that comes back, it's processed, and we very carefully look for these contacts that we want to prosecute in the follow-on missions. You know where I live. We're still waiting on the actual truth data to come back, but we expect that uh, we did detect the mines out there that, that uh, we were intended to search for, and we achieved all of our mission objectives. Our next step would be to reconfigure the helo from non-tow to tow configuration. We're going to do that today? That's a big job. I think we're going to start it today. Yeah. I got the tail. With the OMID's run completed, they turn their attention to the next phase, searching for mines further below the surface. By helicopter, the flight crew will lower a sonar device into the water and tow it. After Alma's missions are successfully completed and the uh, surface of the water space is safe for our towed sensors to be put in, we configure the aircraft from a base H-60 helicopter to one that is capable to tow a Q-20 sonar system, uh, which we have here uh, sitting on the deck. We tow it behind the helicopter using a reeling winch. But the helicopter will only do a fraction of this search. The bulk of the work will be done by the cornerstone of the mission package, a semi-submersible called the RMMV. This is a diesel-powered RMV remote mine hunting system. That includes this black vehicle here and this sonar down here. That's an AQS-20. Still an early prototype, it's launched from the back of the ship and uses the same sonar device as the helicopter, but can last 18 hours before refueling a big advantage over doing it from the air. What RMV brings to the table is endurance, really is the workhorse. When the sun goes down, ship lighting is switched to red to keep the ship's profile to a minimum. As civilians check the readiness of the vehicle, Lieutenant Commander Lance Ruth makes sure his men are ready for the challenges ahead. Port. Stand at ease. Anybody have any concerns, anything that's come up over the last couple of days? It's better that we discover the problems now than discover them tomorrow. LPOs, you got anything to put out, Chiefs? Because this is all developmental testing, it is kind of a science project. It's about proof of concept. It's about taking the idea and making it a reality. The idea is to actually put the vehicle out and leave it out overnight and then recover in the morning. There will be some long days involved, so 
Get your rest when you can get it. The mission will actually go for about 18, 20 hours. So this is something that will, will in a way, uh, mature us to know what to expect and how to handle it. Because once we're operational and we got a whole minefield that we got to clear, it's going to be a lot worse. Years of development and millions of dollars are on the line when testing resumes in the morning. We're all geared towards success. Nobody out here wants to fail. USS Freedom has already suffered the breakdown of one of its 30 millimeter guns, but the other gun mount is still working. So the crew moves on to the next big test. Count on the bridge. We're going to be going against remote controlled boats. They're going to be heading at the ship about 30 plus knots. This is really kind of the graduate level exercise that we're doing today. This is Warship One. Not the high speed operations. All vessels requested to stand clear in my wake. A uh, very challenging swarm attack is what we call it. We're a hostile nation. We're trying to overwhelm our defenses. Green light, NBA, green light. Bridge Eye, all stations, uh, whoever sees the visual on these guys first, call it out. And Dorna can see them. Dorna, 067, 8 miles. There we go. Tracking Dorna High, 067, 8 miles. The ship's sensors have picked up five remote controlled boats approaching from several kilometers out and not yet visible to the naked eye. Swing back around. Let the bridge know we're coming over to course uh, 330. Dean must use Freedom's speed and quick turning ability to intercept the fast moving targets. Uh, let's go ahead and get boost chest engaged. Boost chest engaged, uh, T6 or 20 knots, sir. Very well. What's the range? 13,000 yards, sir. Zero well. one. Captain, got him visually. Second? Uh, got him visually right oh. here. Uh, two points out the port bow. What's their speed? 39 knots. 9,000 yards of closing. Five boats are racing towards Freedom at 55 kilometers per hour. When the Freedom deploys in the near future, every decision the commander makes in a situation like this could mean the difference between life and death. Officer deck, left full, 340. Jets are left, 30 degrees, coming to 340. Right, let's get up to speed in front of these guys. Yeah, here we go, here we go. This is where we make our money, Chief. I want to see this thing drive. It's going to go fast. It's going fast is awesome. All right, well, there they are, right there. Got them. Range. Range, 5,000 yards. All right. All right, let's go. Here we go. Jets to center. We're at 32 and increasing. 33 knots and increasing. 33 and a half, 34, 36 knots and increasing. All right. When you're looking at the ships doing 39 knots and you got vessels inbound to you, they're doing 39, 40 knots, all of a sudden you're talking about a pretty quick closure rate. 6,000 yards every three minutes. Yeah. So a lot of things are changing quickly. We're at 37 knots. Let them know we're starting to uh, cut across them. As freedom closes in on the attacking forces, Thien executes another tactical maneuver. I'm, uh, I'm going to cut across in front of him, get him in uh, 301's uh, firing arcs. He prepares to cut across the path of the approaching boats before opening fire. We cross the T, which is a classic naval maneuver for gunfire. 38 knots, sir. One of my biggest weapons is my wake. I throw about a 20-foot wall of water when I'm going fast. Increase your butt, get to left 15. Left 15 on. So with the small boats, when I cut across them and create a wake, I need to gauge, OK, how fast are they going to move through the wake so I know a good open fire range. Should be coming into uh, 301's cutouts here if they're not already there. BMC, say speed of the contacts. 20 knots, sir. 20? Yes, sir. Really? All right. Yeah. The captain's tactics might be working too well. Their speed, 21. That's it? Really? No way. Whips. Man, they was going like 40 knots, and they slowed down like Wicked 2.7 is their yeah. closing distance. Really? Really? They're not going that fast? They're going like 40 freaking knots. Yeah, we outran them. I think your wake might have got them. They want to call and knock it off and okay. uh, reset. Very well. Bridge Eye slowing down now at 22 knots. That was very anticlimactic. Thien's aggressive driving has created a massive wake that overwhelms the remote controlled boats. They're no longer moving fast enough for the high speed shootout. Cat and I, yeah, I turned a little bit too early on that one, and uh, they were coming in like 30, almost 40, then they slowed down a whole heck of a lot. So, uh, anyways, Roger that. I'll make sure they can come in a little closer before I shoot them. Drop boost shots? Yeah, drop boost. It'll take a while to set to reset, so drop boost. 
All stations, red range, red range. We kept them farther away from us than uh, they wanted to be. So uh, I can I controlled the battle space with my speed. I mean, hell, I can't set it up. <laughs> I can't set it up much better than that. So uh, it was a, a good run for the ship. Uh, we we controlled the fight, which is uh, what you want to do all the time. The test designers are not pleased. They need to prove Freedom can take out attackers with her new guns, not her wake. Project officer Mike Molino needs the captain's help to make it happen. It completely made our test event very difficult. Yeah. So you know your tactics next time? You're yeah. ready to reset? Yeah. And we got an idea of how they're going to drive now, too. Yep. So which gives us a bit very, of an advantage. Very wimpily. Yeah. It's okay, we won't control both. We do how we want to do. I know. They really want us to kill them. I know. Uh, and I really want to kill them. <laughs> In my own special way. Buddy. Okay. Uh, Every captain is unique and unto their own. It's his ship. He does what he wants with his ship. So we have to be, we have to flex to that. The new gun has yet to fire a shot at the fast moving targets. Captain Thien will have one more try to prove it can get the job done. Cutting across them, we weren't going that fast when we cut across them. So it wasn't that bad, but it wasn't that bad. We know we can run with them. We can run with them. With precious time slipping away, Freedom quickly repositions and starts again. All right, about two zero knots. Uh, we're gonna open up to about five miles from these guys, and then uh, come the event. We're gonna swing around, do exactly what we just did. Yeah, TA. TA nine. Five miles from these guys, and then come back the event. We're gonna swing around, do exactly what we just did. Oh, this one. We got contacts there. It's that blob right about there. Yeah. So 25 degrees off port bow. Range visually clear. Range visually and by radar. Closing at a fast rate of speed I. MPA, turn around 47, 4500, and that'll be perfect. This time, the captain turns the ship while the boats are further away in an effort to reduce interference from his wake. <laughs> perfect. Coming left. Set web is posture one, mount 301. Set web posture one, mount 301. Stand by for open fire. Stand by. Stand by to open fire. T open has still hold the range electronically. Freedom's speed allows her to move quickly into range for the 30 millimeter gun. Yeah, I can't give anything better than this. I really can't. 3,600 yards. But it needs to fire before any advantage is lost, and attacking forces unleash their weapons. Why are we not shooting? Come on. 3,000 yards. Very well. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Ask TAO why we're not shooting yet. There oh, we go. go. That's what I want to hear. Really? Come on now. We're gonna shoot some stuff. Tear the crap out of these guys. Ha, 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 ha. a little long. Yeah. After firing single rounds, the gunner tries to overwhelm the boats with a series of rapid bursts. Go and burst. You guys got any clue why hold, I can't hold fire? Why are we not shooting you? Captain, there's a fault on Mount 301. No way. You can't make this up. What's your fault? You're shooting. It's coming off and on. AOMC clear fault. Attempting to fire. You still got a green to shoot high. Well, apparently it didn't fall as much as we thought. We're still shooting. Only able to shoot one round at a time. Bridge copies. Captain, only able to shoot one round at a time with 301. Well, shoot, run round faster. All right. We have a GTU fail fault on Mount 301. Unable to shoot with Mount 301. Recommend break off. Unable to shoot, recommend break off. After a fitful start, the remaining 30 millimeter gun has stopped working. All stations hold fire, exiting the state fire and bearings. Hold fire, exiting the state fire and bearings. Break hold fire, fire, sir. Hold fire. fire. All right, here we go. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, cease fire on this mount. We're going to finish this exercise right now. Uh, we got to figure out what the hell is going on with this gun now. All right, sir. Cease fire. All All right, go ahead and slow back down. All right, sir. Coming down. With one gun down, Freedom could continue the tests. But losing this second gun is a game changer. If technicians can't quickly fix the problem, they may have to pull the plug on the entire mission. It's believed to be one of the safeties built into the gun, maybe giving us problems. We know that if we fire the gun when the ship is traveling at bare steerage, three knots, we do not see this fault. But we know that it does fault when the ship is blasting along at 30 knots plus. It's shaking and jiggling, and now there's a lot more motion involved. Hopefully, we can try to find some sort of engineering solution to this problem. 
Thien is still hoping any needed repairs can be made quickly and at okay, sea. Sir, I... He and his crew have a good battle rhythm building. All right, Mike, what's the plan? We got a plan? And the commander the wants to minimize here. any possible delays that would interrupt their momentum. Uh, so the part arrives tomorrow at noon. Oh. They would like to ship to pull in port Friday and then get underway Monday. Yes, I know. The general dynamics tech doesn't show up till Saturday. Why don't we just pull in? Why don't we just pull in on Saturday then instead? Because that's overtime on the tugs. And the part arrives tomorrow at noon. They want to start on that part and troubleshoot for as long as they can. Really? There's an upside to this. It means we still get to test. The consensus is to temporarily halt Freedom's testing and head to nearby Port Wainimi for repairs. Get with Ops. Uh, let him know that's the plan. I'll put it in an email right now. Yep. Cool. Thanks, Captain. Thanks. This testing is incredibly expensive. It's not my call. That decision is made by people on the beach, the people from the program office. They're the ones paying for all this. We need to demonstrate that the system works, and if we know we have a problem, we have to fix the problem before we move forward. Otherwise, we're just wasting taxpayer dollars. Sailors belong on ships and ship belong at sea. But uh, this is why we're out here, to test the weapon systems, to test the systems, to test the ship. But uh, it's always frustrating that nothing works how it's supposed to work. Not so happy about this. I understand. I'm just saying. I understand. All right. Thank you. Thanks. After searching for shallow water mines by air, USS Independence's search now switches to deeper waters. I don't know, I think the seas look favorable. They're a little choppy. Yeah, they'll support, they're flattening out by going into them. The crew prepares to launch the helicopter and the semi-submersible known as the RMMB simultaneously. Once the ship is deployed to a hot zone, it can use both methods to scour minefields. I hope we get moving here. I kind of want to get this thing in the water. It's a tense day for all on board. It's the first time the Navy crew will launch the $12 million mine hunting vehicle on their own. Today, the sailors are taking complete control of the system. So Bay, which means that the ship is stable on a course and speed, and we're not pitching and rolling all that much so that the vehicle can't actually be launched. The flow field behind the ship with the water coming out of the water jets is very important. Once this thing hits the water, if you've got only one of your engines online or if they're not in exact parallel, then the flow of the water is going to push it off to the side one way or the other, which it's just being held by three lines. It could get knocked off center. It could do all kinds of bad things. Green mission bay. Green mission bay. Sailing on tag line four, disconnect four. We're uh, coming out with the vehicle all the way to the suspended position now. Slack out of tow on high. Raise the last line. During the launch, some systems aboard the RMMB are controlled through a detachable spine. Drop operator is, is controlling the vehicle from a, a visual line of sight. The spine is quickly released when the semi-submersible hits the water to prevent damage to the vehicle and the ship. Next piece is to put it in the water. All right. Lower. Lower it on. And a little quicker. Little quicker boat. We're going. Down. Down. You got, a lot, you got a lot of tension in Shockle 5. Last time. What happened? They're having a hard time releasing the captain's line. So what's happening right now? What are we waiting on? I just want to be sure we're moving along here because time is important. 
Success. The capture spine retracts into the mission bay, and the RMMV is off to search for mines. Tell that released. But the crew has no time to celebrate the successful launch. All right, gentlemen, we gotta go to flight quarters. The ship is the flight quarters of all our traffic drivers on station. With the RMMV away, the crew scrambles to get the helicopter launched on its tow mission. The idea now is that uh, we launch a helicopter to conduct similar operations in a separate area. So we have basically tandem operations from uh, the surface as well as from the air. This crew is working in a simulated minefield, but sea mines remain a persistent global threat. The Navy is hoping these tools will be a safe and reliable means to quickly clear suspected danger areas. Captain's on the bridge. All right, course 310. With the search for mines underway, concur three four four. Three four one. Captain Olin is free to maneuver the independence away from the area. It's one thing that's really unique about mine hunting with LCS. You used to really have to uh, put the crew in a lot of danger to try to find them. Uh, with LCS, we don't do that. We keep the ship safe and we send uh, unmanned vehicles in to do it for us. The semi-submersible is now controlled from the shipboard control room. The sonar device, which is attached to the vehicle, is deployed and then towed at variable depths in order to hunt and identify mine threats. Not only do we drive the vehicle and control the offboard vehicles from the room, we also process all of the data coming in from the sensors. While the RMMV searches the minefield, the helicopter simultaneously launches its own sonar. Equipped with a 580-meter tow line, the aviation crew can sweep a different area. It goes down into whatever uh, depth volume you're searching, and it just runs racetracks back and forth, looking uh, for mine-like objects. While the helicopter will make several short runs, the RMMV will keep running well into the night. But six hours into its mission, it's in trouble. So what do you got? Uh, sir, the operator noticed that there was a drop in hydraulic pressure. Then they looked at the fluid level, and it was about a liter below. The sonar's been retrieved. It's bellied up to the vehicle. The team has identified a problem that could render the semi-submersible dead in the water. We had a report with the remote mine hunting vehicle that it had a low hydraulic level on one of its uh, systems. If the RMMV loses too much hydraulic pressure, its mechanical systems will fail, and it will be impossible to maneuver the vehicle back onto the ship. To recover now is basically just giving us an opportunity to get it on board, as opposed to uh, saying it's, uh, it's the end of the mission. Let's uh, man the launch handling and recovery detail. Launch handling and recovery detail. Man the launch handling and recovery detail. We don't want to take any chances, so just to be safe, we're going to go ahead and recover the vehicle. With civilian and Navy personnel on edge, Independence carefully aligns itself with the approaching RMMV. As the vehicle nears, the captain gets an urgent call from the ship's chief engineer about a new problem, this time on board the ship. What am I looking at here? Chief engineer discovered that he was developing a hydraulic leak on a high pressure hose on our port diesel steering unit. That's this thing hammers, there's rupture. A ruptured hose is a chief engineer's yeah. worst nightmare. There'd be oil all over that engine room. And next thing you know, you have a big fire. The potential for fire is no small threat. As recently as 1989, 53 Navy crewmen died fighting major fires on two separate fleet vessels. So this, this potentially could be a catastrophic uh, event for us. I've got to get this vehicle back on board, so should I continue with the recovery and then fix this? Maybe I need to get the vehicle on board stop everything so you can fix this. To repair the hose, Busig must turn off the port engine, but that would make recovery of the RMMV impossible. 
I have to keep both diesel engines running when I launch and recover the mine hunting vehicle because you have to have a really smooth fluid flow behind the ship so you don't disrupt the vehicle as it drives really close in behind the ship. Can I hold out for an hour? I'm gonna hold out for an hour, but okay. I can't guarantee you, sir. Come to hammer. It's already got a leak in it. Olin must now balance the safety of his ship and crew against his desire to keep the mission moving forward. We need to do an expedited recovery. I need to get that thing okay. on board very okay. quickly. Put okay. a normal, uh, fully qualified operator on the ROP. I need to get this thing moving. We're gonna go in here. All right, do we have a visual on this thing back here? Olin gambles that he can bring the RMMV on board before the hose bursts, risking a serious engine fire. If that hose ruptures, I'm gonna lose 150 gallons of hydraulic oil in the space. And a lot of oil is pretty dangerous, but I can't conduct the mission without that engine running. So we're gonna run the port engine, but we're gonna keep the water jet center line. That way there's no hydraulic hammer on that hose. And we're gonna steer with the starboard engine only long enough to get the RMB back on the ship. Yeah. Hope we can get it on board here quickly. In the engine room, Chief Engineer Busick wraps the damaged hose to try to contain the spread of oil should it rupture under the continued pressure of the engines. Well, that's good. It ruptures at least and it's deflecting to keep it from going everywhere. Evaluator package, we are lowering the capture spine now. It's steady right now, but we're still in extremis. In the mission bay, readings indicate the RMMB's hydraulic pressure is reaching critically low levels. If its onboard engine fails, could drift helplessly away from the ship. Captain, right now it's at 0.65. If it reaches 0.5, then the vehicle automatically shuts itself down. Okay. All right, well, we need to get this done quickly. All right, Captain. All right. We just got to get the mast into the trap. A Navy crewman manning the tow lines and a crane precisely guides the capture spine into position to latch onto the mast. Go get him, cowboy. Go get him. An extremely tricky maneuver when traveling in varying sea conditions. We're close here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The front line came out. It's like threading a needle. The oil level just dropped. It really closed down. We don't have enough hydraulics to get that mass down. We can't bring it in. It's still redlining right now. Now. Uh. I think they got it. Yeah. Got it. The capture spine is now connected to the RMMB, and the crew takes control of its recovery. This is a RMMB's out the water. It's close. Bridge captain, shut down the port diesel and the port water jet. They begin the careful process of moving it back into the mission bay. As soon as I had that vehicle lifted and out of the water, we declutched and secured that engine on the port side before we ruptured the hose. And that could have ruptured at any second. We're gonna commence repairs on the hydraulic hose and the mine men will start inspecting the remote mine hunting vehicle. We got lucky here. The day was not a total loss for USS Independence. The helicopter mission went off without a hitch, but the RMMV only made it a third of the way through its test. Until they can get their workhorse back in the water, the mine hunting mission is at a standstill. We have to pull into port in a couple of days to refuel. My goal is to try to get it in the water so we can complete the mission before we make our next port visit, because otherwise we have to make that time up later, and quite frankly, we're running out of time. We have to be done with this particular phase because there's a whole another phase of testing that we have to do for the next underway period, and then there's one more period after that. Really, the schedule has to stay the way it is in the big picture. Overnight, they determined that a broken actuator, a small motor that powers one of the RMMB's stabilizing fins, is the source of the hydraulic leak. Here she comes. Oh, she's moving. Early in the day, a new actuator arrives at the ship via small boat transfer. Bridge, but uh, cargo transfer complete. And the new part is quickly in the hands of technicians. But they still need another piece of equipment to complete the repair. What it is is a hydraulic purge unit. It's a kit that they need to send down to the RMB to clean out the hydraulic system and run it. 
uh, but it's about a thousand pounds, so it's too big to put in a boat to send out to us. So they're sending a helicopter out. But Captain Olin's headaches are far from over. The HPU that we need to fix the RMMV, is that uh, going to be en route here soon? They said the weather's pretty bad out there. They're not sure when they're going to be able to take off. I've got the piece of equipment, I've got an aircraft standing by to deliver it, but there's fog in Panama City and now I can't get the aircraft airborne. Well, no, I don't want to scrub anything. We don't, we don't scrub or cancel. I don't want to sacrifice anything. As long as it's safe, we need to push on. All right, thanks. At this point, there's nothing Captain Olin can do but wait. Usually when we can get an hour or two in a schedule, we try to run a, a no-notice drill. All right, I'm in route to medical. Making a safe route? Yeah. I thought we were going to set up the Y-gate and have two hoses like we had last time. I got to go get it. With just a few short hours left before Freedom returns to port, Captain Thien finds another exercise to keep his crew sharp. Not the worst than a board captain. Another gun shoot got canceled. Uh, we're all about adapt and overcome, so we're going to do some damage control training. Let's go ahead and split up. CMC, if you could be the first plugman, man up the hoses. He orders his crew to man the hoses for a fire drill. Water on. Three over the side. Fire. Down low. There you go. Down low. Down low. Move around. Everyone down low. There you go. <laughs> for Thien, this drill is more than preparing for danger on the high seas. It's a means of building morale. The, the captain's energy is, is pretty much, it's infectious, I would say. Uh, definitely, um, that energy kind of feeds us and kind of keeps us going. Every crew uh, reflects the personality of the commanding officer. Uh, his energy uh, resonates in all of us, uh, and it's, it's just, it's a fun place to be. I love training. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> Spirits are high as Freedom arrives at Port Wainimi, a naval base 100 kilometers northwest of Los Angeles. The ship will dock here for two days to make repairs to the gun mounts, and the captain doesn't want his crew to lose their edge. Don't let yourselves get out of the groove we're in and the tactical mindset. When we get back underway on Monday, it's going to be an hour transit to on the range and putting rounds down range, OK? We need to be ready for that ASAP. We are here to fix weapons so we can go out and shoot and kill things, OK? So everybody needs to keep that in your brains. Freedom's crew must wait out the weekend before they know if they can return to the firing range to complete their mission. There's always a time crunch. Uh, there's some risk to accomplishing our mission all the way, but right now we can't complete the mission without the guns being fixed. Oh, there she is. On USS Independence, it's already late afternoon when a helicopter delivers the 1,000-pound hydraulic purge unit needed to complete the RMMV repair. Captain Olin has been waiting most of the day for its arrival, and his patience is wearing thin. This is the most ridiculously large thing I've ever seen. Uh, you know, the, the silly thing is, is I've got one of these on the ship that we use for uh, flushing out our steering gear units on the ship. It's the same thing. It's a little bit smaller. Maybe all we just needed was the proper fittings. You know, you could have done this whole repair yourself. You do it on the ship every day. Uh, changing the connector out right now. Yeah. And, Civilian specialists, uh, led by mission package test officer Milt Sauls, still have a lot of work to do to get the RMMV up and running. We have replaced the actuator, and now they're going to continue to purge air out of the system. So that's where we are right now. Captain Olin is hoping the crew can begin their pre-dive test in a few hours. Right, carry on, everybody, please. A schedule that will still leave his team with little time to rest before the morning launch. The hydraulic uh, purge, has that already started? That is underway right now. It's underway yes, right now. 
and we think that's going to take about three to four. Three to four hours. Yep. We do have to do regression testing post after putting the control surface back on. He gets more unexpected news. The civilian specialists want to run another series of tests before they turn the vehicle over to the Navy. That's what we're looking to start pre dive at midnight. That's six hours from now. Yes, sir. That's not good enough. We've got to come up with a better plan than that. This casualty on the Armin V is not that complicated. This has been made into a much bigger deal than it is. We're not going to do nine hours of maintenance to get this thing ready to launch. That is not a good answer. This turnaround is not acceptable. All right, um, that's all I have. Carry on, please. All right. Choke Frank for throwing a wrench at the end of the meeting, and it was unnecessary. So I think that the captain, that when he was told about some kind of integrity test, that he got the impression that it was going to be extended, and that's not the case. So these maintenance times continue to grow and grow and grow, and now we're saying we need nine hours to prepare this. Right. That is not acceptable. You can turn around an F-18 on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier in less time than that. Right. I've seen it. We can shorten anything. We will. Everything, yes. everything that needs to be done is it something to be necessary. Done. You can't, you can't shortchange it. And we're not, we're not shortening anything, and we're not extending anything. If we allowed this thing to be milked out for the next two weeks, that would happen. So enough. It's unacceptable. And, and the captain has got to be convinced here. I, yes. under, I understand. Yeah. I'm, I'm prepared to be flexible. Yeah. But he is pretty pissed. OK, so we need to have a list of a timeline and get it done. It seems like every time we make a little bit of progress, somebody throws another requirement in. And uh, it's very frustrating for me because I'm very mission and success oriented. And if we can execute the mission and we can do it safely and effectively, I want to move forward. Now the only thing I'm hoping for is an accelerated procedure. We're working on it. I know. The workers have gotten the message from Captain Olin, and they double their efforts to complete the repair. Captain uh, showed that he has the will to, to get this testing done. Our intentions are to be ready for uh, launch first thing in the morning. The pressure's on for the team. They work feverishly through the night to complete repairs on the damaged vehicle. It sounds like pre-dives on the RMB are complete. Yes, sir. That's the word that you're getting? OK. That's good others. news. They're all on our. With all systems go, the RMMV can now continue its search for mines. All right, console's up. Look at their midship now, I launch an RMMV. All right, 180, 5.5, .5. let's go. Not a minute into the launch, the repaired fin on the RMMV begins to malfunction. You see the fins already start moving? Did you have control of it, Boyd? I did. Did you have control? Let your capture spine go. On top of that, the remote operator can't disconnect the capture spine from the vehicle. What? What happened? Hold on. Bass, hold on. Bass. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. You don't have control. What happened? I don't know. Hey, take a look at that tow hook. How did that tow hook come up? It's jammed up. It's caught on the capture spine. Capture spine is stuck on the tow hook. See how the uh, tow line right in the front is straight up? It's supposed to be laid back right now. No, but more important is that fin right there. Hey, is that the issue why it was broke the first time, the fin, the hydraulic? That's the fin we replaced. Is it? Yeah. Once again, the RMMV is unable to perform its mission. So you can't raise it at all? No, sir. Not only is the stabilizing fin malfunctioning again, this time there's a problem with the tow hook used to retrieve the vehicle. It should not be in an up position. So you, to me, it failed. So there could be a leak up there? Yes, sir. OK, so we're done for the day. Although it's an early prototype, the RMMV is the centerpiece of this mission package. Its repeated breakdown is a serious setback for the entire LCS program. Every time a system doesn't get off the deck, that impacts our whole timeline. And that's where we suffer the most. It eats into your manpower, it eats into your time. It just can be mentally overwhelming. 
But despite the bad hand he's been dealt, Olin's not ready to fold. I'm trying to be very aggressive and ensuring that we keep things moving along. His team has located and identified enough mines to keep the mission on track. The captain still has one card left to play. All right, we need to uh, plan the remaining three days that we have. I mean, it's going to be aviation-centric. We'll plan the next mission over the, co the calls that we got from the RMV mission that we ran. They decide to move forward to the third stage of the detect to engage scenario. Ready? It's finally time to let the airborne mine neutralization system, known as AMNS, take out the identified mines. The ship's helicopter will carry the AMNS and lower it into the water. The pod releases neutralizers, known as archer fish, which swim up to the mines and detonate. This is a way to be able to separate ourselves from that minefield and maintain a safe distance and keep our sailors safe. Back off. The mine does explode. We're, we're in the air, we're not in the water. OS-1 McComb should be giving you a bearing to the ship. But before they can get the AMNS airborne, the captain confronts yet another obstacle. Water spout warnings in our immediate area. All right, thanks. Captain. Uh, we've been watching the weather very closely, and we've got a pretty big storm getting ready to come through the op area. A powerful storm is rolling in that will sit over the area for two days, bringing conditions that are unacceptable for testing. It looks like it's going to have uh, seas upwards of 11 feet. We've been doing everything we possibly can to conduct operations, but weather has been uh, very unfavorable. Seas are going to stay high, I and mean, we can operate in that sea state, but there's just no reason to. It's an unnecessary risk, and I certainly cannot conduct uh, the operations I have scheduled for those days in 11-foot seas. Olin is already on a tight schedule, and the storm isn't expected to clear before the ship is due back in port to refuel. The captain well, we a makes a difficult decision. So we're making preparations to pull into port tomorrow morning. That's all. Thank you. He's taking independence into port early without completing the detect to engage mission. It's a disappointing turn of events after so much hard work. So Olin gathers his team one more time to see if they can somehow salvage the mission. Thanks a lot, Dad. Can everybody stand at these, please? The mission team needs to figure out how do we capitalize on the remaining hours that we have, and that's what we've got. Right. We, we do have the option, sir. This is way outside of the box, but we can launch PSI. side. I'm OK with launching a mission from the ship on Monday if uh, I get clearance from uh, base ops to do it. I have no problem doing that at all. Would you see any problem with that option? You. Lieutenant Kipper comes up with another option. Instead of at sea, he suggests conducting the final phase of the mission from port. You just got to work it with uh, base ops. <laughs> you, are you happy? I'm happy, yes. Now I'm happy. <laughs> all right. When you're in testing, you have to come up with lots of workarounds. Nothing goes as planned. The initial plan just gives you some practice on how to replan. That's about all it does for you. Will do, sir. All right, thank you. We say Semper Gumby, always flexible. We're trying really hard to continue with our mission, even though the ship is coming into port due to weather. So we're going to keep working uh, tactically as though we were at sea on Monday. Uh, the only difference is we're going to be tied up next to the pier for that one day. Here's Aiden Hazard, our boys, three and four off the bow. As they pull into port, the team is upbeat that they can finally complete their mission. But as the entire Independence crew has learned the hard way, there are no guarantees that they can pull this off. Test team, if you need to go check your equipment, sensors, whatever, get out there and do it now. USS Freedom remains docked in Port Wyneme as civilian specialists wrap up repairs on her two 30 millimeter gun mounts. The end is in sight. There's light at the end of the tunnel. After two days on dry land, 
the captain and crew are itching to return to the firing range to finish testing. Just tell me what's going on. 30 millimeter guns, compact modular sight on Mountain 302 is installed. All right, sounds good. You ready to shoot? Ready to shoot, sir. Guns up, ready for fire, right? Let's go, sir. We'll do it. Oh, thanks, you boss. The repairs are completed on USS Freedom's broken 30 millimeter guns. Officer Deck, how are we coming? And it's time to head out. All right, MPA, let's get some headway and get the heck out of here. I need to go fast in about two minutes. Captain Thien makes quick work of getting back to sea. Freedom prepares for a major exercise using all her guns and a helicopter to prove she can counter an attack by high-speed targets. Touch on deck. Here we go. He gathers Here his on. command team to make sure they're ready to go. Holy crap, finally getting to shoot the dang guns. Outstanding. Lots of good work been done, fixing the, uh, fixing the goofy things up. Uh, we're going to go out zero fire them, going to go out and do some tactical testing, some driving ship fast, and uh, find out exactly how she operates. But to do that, they must first recalibrate the repaired 30 millimeter gun. So the team takes aim on another killer tomato. It's called a zeroing of the gun. So since we just did these repairs to Mount 302, basically replacing the sight on them, we need to kind of test it where we'll shoot, see where it hits, and then we'll adjust the sighting from there. Tomato passing the bow. It's a make or break moment for the crew. These guns must hit their marks before Freedom can move on to the final test. TOMBC, we have uh, permission to kill tomato. Looks like it was right on target, though. Two seven to right. All right, you were to right. Shoot it. Perfect. That was dead on. Direct hit. Awesome. I think if we just shoot like what we did that last round, we'll kill whatever we shoot that. Now that the 30 millimeter guns are zeroed in, they unleash their final rounds. It's guns versus killer tomatoes. And it's not even close. Woo! That's a direct hit. <laughs> guns did great. It took them a little bit to get it zeroed in, but once they got it zeroed in, I pretty much finished the target off. That was kind of sweet. <laughs> The 30 millimeter mounts have passed with flying colors, but their next test won't be so easy. Tomorrow, Commander Thien and his crew will have to face off against five incoming enemy boats, moving almost as fast as the speed demon Freedom herself. USS Independence has returned to port after a powerful storm interrupted her mine hunting mission. But she has a job to finish. Now the helicopter will make a 150 kilometer flight back out to the danger area. The purpose of this mission is to neutralize the mines that, that were found using the other sensors. So whereas uh, Q20 and Almonds were looking for mines, uh, this is going out and individually destroying each mine that we found using the other system. Got to. The hands clear coming up. The AMNS carries four armed 16 kilogram self propelled archer fish that are deployed underwater. But on today's exercise, the crew won't have the satisfaction of seeing them detonate their targets. They will not be live ordnance, so there won't be an explosion because. We're shooting at a, a training mine that we don't want to destroy, and the uh, archer fish units cost several thousand dollars. There's no shape charge in the nose of these destructors, so we just touch the mine um, with the destructor, and we've completed that sequence. For the entire crew of USS Independence, it's a pivotal moment, the culmination of all their difficult work. This is a proof of concept, uh, shows that the tech to engage sequence works, at least notionally, can be conducted from the ship with the personnel on board, uh, and is a real big check in the box for the uh, objectives of this test. Amber deck. Amber deck. If they can pull this mission off, their testing cycle will be a success. 
failure could mean costly delays for the LCS program. Seahawk arrives at the minefield. The crew lowers the pod with the archer fish into the sea. Flashes in the water. Roger, you are clear to launch neutralizer. Roger, launching neutralizer. On board the chopper, the remote operator locks onto his targets and then releases the lethal archer fish, which is equipped with both video camera and sonar. Got a video. And neutralizers away. Copy. Flying in. Now, the archer fish heads for its target. And I got the contact on sonar. SOR on. Roger. It closes in on a moored mine. Pass master. Roger. Master arm is armed. Trigger pulled. The archer fish is just centimeters away from the mine. Good hit. Archer fish is dead on, accomplishing what everyone on the Independence was hoping for. I'm very proud of everybody in my crew. Uh, they come through, you know, with flying colors, and uh, couldn't be more pleased. We were able to complete the entire detect to engage sequence. This cabin, you have green deck. Green deck. Green deck. We knew it was going to be hard coming into this test, but we still met the objective. It's my birthday today. I am going to shore and having a beer. We're all gone. We'll hug it out. No, hug it out. No, no. <laughs> uh, we did have a casualty that we had to recover from, but we proved that we were able to change the mission execution. And keep in mind that this is a test phase, and uh, we don't expect everything to go perfectly, uh, but we're very satisfied with the results that we saw. The civilian specialists will take what they've learned and incorporate improvements into the RMMB, moving it one step closer to success. We work for you, boss. <laughs> <laughs> Mine warfare is hard, and it's the miners that make it hard. They have technology on their side, and we're always in a constant battle to be able to counter those threats and keep our ships safe when they're underway. Thank you for the good yeah. flight, too, by the way. No problem. With their backs against the wall, the crew of the USS Independence stepped up and completed their test mission. But USS Freedom is still out at sea. Go, on, go chase some guys down, blow some stuff up. And her crew still has something to prove. In a few hours, Freedom will face off against five eight-meter-long remote-controlled boats that will close in on the ship at 40 knots. Yeah, LF-04 against the small boats. Hell yeah, let's go tear those things up. All right, uh, we're ready. Questions, comes difficulties? We are, Captain. Let's twice, twice, break. Let's go and kill them damn things. The stakes have never been higher. The crew has not fired their guns at speed. If they falter on this final test, it will be a major setback for all on board. Every time we get out, we have to show improvement. Otherwise, there's no point. If we're going backwards, no one likes to go backwards. Flight quarters, flight quarters. Designated personnel, man your flight quarter station. All hands not involved. Flight quarters stand clear after frame 56. This is the grand finale, graduation exercise from this testing. This is what we came out here to do. This is going to be challenging. We're going to get them employed some tactics, all within this one engagement until all the boats are destroyed. We're ready to go. The helicopter will provide location and speed of the inbound contacts and relay target information back to the ship. In today's mission, our role is to launch a helo, detect the small boat targets, track them for the ship, and then get out of the way so the ship can engage with their weapons. Captain MPC, set weapons posture two, mount 301, 302. All right, I'm going on to combat. Comes off the bridge, on the way to combat. The captain heads to the mission control center as the conflict draws near. Freedom has a lot on her plate. Today's the big game day. We have the ship fixed. Ship goes fast now. We have guns that are working and some good range coordination. Make sure those targets are out there and we'll tear them up. Until they are within visual range of the ship, the helicopter continues to track the targets. All right, coming in on the contacts. 
All the instruments are looking good. Coming out. It transmits the coordinates back to mission control. This is it. First uh, set of boats coming in. Heads up, track 81164, Fort Porter. Small boats, composition four, a hostile. Kill 81164 with a gun. Got the guy coming up the left side. 6,000 yards. 267, 6K. Got a lot of sea clutter over there. With the target info relayed, the helicopter clears the range. Now freedom can begin the engagement. After days of missed opportunities, the moment of truth has finally come. Bridge copy. The captain returns to the bridge, where he can command the ship's movements. Cam's on the bridge. Kill 81164 with guns, 5,000 yards. All right, they're 5-1 cut out, take me to swing around all the way to the uh, left. The distance to the target steadily narrows. And CIO captain uh, coming around left, get ready to uh, engage. Captain CEO, engagement in progress. Still moving. 2,200. Yeah, good hit. Oh, that one's done. Look at that. One target is destroyed, but four more are closing in. Farmos left contact dead in the water. Shift targets. Come right, 210. Shifting fires. Captain Thien must take them out before they get dangerously close to the ship. Increase your run and right ball! Right ball, my runner is right ball! Nice, great hits. Ship fired on target, CRW! Shift and fire. Second target destroyed, shift fire to the next target. Shift fire. Threats on the uh, port beam. Come on, Bridge, threat right now on the port beam. Get ready to uh, engage with 5-1 coming from the uh, port side as I swing around. The captain turns freedom quickly as the targets move around the ship. One minute they're on one side, and next minute the other side, so you gotta be able to react quickly. Took in five round versus eyes. 1,800. Continue coming right. All right, continue right. Gotta hit that time. Get in the water, nice shot. Direct hit. Shift fire to the next two! Shift fire. As the final two enemy targets approach the ship, Freedom's weapons take deadly aim. talking about. Now, Freedom is down to one target. Right full runner! Right full runner, right! Runner is right full! He's still moving! Keep firing! Keep firing! Oh, not the man. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Forgot the humanity in the front. Oh, yeah. Oh. Runner midship! Runner midship's high! Good shot. Good shot. It's an impressive display of firepower. <laughs> Each target is destroyed. Dale, embassy, all contacts, dead in the water. One of the first times we've had the opportunity to combine everything, the ship's speed, and then also firing all the weapons. We've gone fast before, we've shot the guns before, but we haven't combined the two of them together. All right, just to wrap things up for what we have accomplished today, five inbound targets. Five mission kills, five mobility kills, five for five, 100% accuracy. Uh, we killed the enemy, and we killed the enemy with a vengeance. So good job on to uh, everybody. The mission was a complete success, destroyed all five, left a few of them smoking, a few of them burning, and but all of them were a mission kill. For first of class ships like Freedom and Independence, it's never an easy road. But during these missions, they were able to overcome serious obstacles and complete their tests, moving the entire LCS program one step closer to deployment with the rest of the fleet. Five months after these exercises, Independence successfully launched and recovered the RMMV after incorporating changes to its design. More LCS ships are on order as Freedom and Independence continue to work out the kinks with their mission packages. We've learned a lot of lessons from the first two ships of the class. We've implemented those lessons learned into the follow-on ship designs. The programmer record is to eventually have 55 of these ships operating in the fleet. 
the LCS program is going to grow significantly in the next couple of years and the types of missions that are performing, the possibilities are endless. The next sailors that will follow in our footsteps, they'll be able to have an easier time because they wouldn't have to go through all these trials that we're going through. I want to take the ship out and want to go deploy. If we're part of the fleet, we need to be out there and doing things for the fleet. There is a crisis that requires freedom. We're ready to go anywhere and do anything. I'm very proud of what these ships and the sailors that man them have been able to achieve. I'm very proud of the defense contractors and government civilian employees that have taken us through all of these various stages of testing. And I look forward to great things from these ships as they enter the fleet in numbers.